All right, let's begin. Now, today we're moving on to 10 C, D, and uh, E, but really it's just 10 C and D. 10 E, I'm just going to tell you a theory, but we'll revise it in the next session as well. Uh, but we're going to start off with revision of last session. Last session we talked about tangents and normals and, and really trying to apply the knowledge that we had from chapter 9. So let's have a look at this problem here. Question 14, it's from your exercise 10A. The tangent to the curve with the equation y equals e, I mean 2 times e to the power of x at the point a 2e to the a passes through the origin, find the value of a. Now, when I read this question, the first thing I see is passes through the origin. What does that tell me already? What's the first thing that you should pick up from that already? If it passes through the origin, what do we know, Leah? It is 0, 0, which is the point, yes? And what else? Something more important. Based on how they worded the question. A lot of students overlook this part when they're reading the question. There's a y intercept and an x intercept at 0. Not an x intercept. There is a y intercept at 0, but y intercept and x intercept of what? Oh, sorry, well, it does have an x intercept. x intercept, y intercept at 0, yes. Well, of what, though? What has an x intercept y intercept? The? The tangent line. And the reason why I'm saying this is, a tangent line is a straight line, right? Straight line is your y equals mx plus c. What we just found out, or based on what they just told us, is they literally just said to you, c is 0. That's what they're telling you. They're saying c equals to 0. How do you know that? Is because they're saying the tangent line passes through 0, 0, meaning that when x is 0, y is 0. So if you type that or put that into the equation, m times 0 plus c, it's clear that c equals 0. Okay? Now the reason why a lot of students overlook this part is because of what happens here. And they get confused. If you actually read the question, it says the tangent to the curve, and if you ignored what the curve was, and at what point, if you just read the tangent to the curve at the point a to, or whatever this x, y quarter is, passes through the origin. That makes a lot of sense because you're saying the tangent passes through the origin. So if the tangent, which is the straight line, passes through the origin, you can already figure out what you know the y intercept has to be c and c has to be zero. Okay? So that's what that origin means. And that generally happens in your um, exams. I do put that in. So re try to re break it up. The part where it says with the equation, normally the equation is longer. And a lot of students get overwhelmed by the number of functions and negatives they have. And they, they miss out on what that origin means, yeah? Uh, and sometimes the, what they normally do then is they sub zero, zero in, and then it doesn't work out, so they're like, oh, maybe I just sub zero in, and they say the answer's two. Okay, but they don't know what they're doing. So that's what I'm trying to say. Just focus on what the question is trying to say and what that origin means. So basically, it just told you is the one intercept is zero. Now remember in chapter 10, I said to find the equation of a tangent line, you only need two things. You need to find C, you need to find M. Now you already found C, you're not, your job is not to find M, but M may help you to solve the problem. Okay? Because the question didn't say find the equation of tangent, the question says find the value of A. So how are we going to do that? So now I know C equals 0. Great. I've got a good start. I've got the tangent line is equal to Y equals MX. That's what I have now. Okay, so that's what I know. I know that this means that the tangent line is Y equals MX. How do I find A? What's the first thing you're going to do? What are you going to do? Can I please say, let's go with BB. Fantastic. Let's start finding M. Okay, you need pieces of the puzzle. You need to sort of put out all the information you have and then solve the puzzle. So right now, you want to find M. Okay, so you want to find the gradient of M, or gradient of the tangent line. How do you find M again? You find the derivative of the curve. Right, so derivative of the curve but remember, the derivative of a curve, you don't find the gradient, you can't find the gradient unless you have a point. So in this case, you're going to find the derivative of the curve at which point? Good, not at the origin. See, a lot of students will then confuse which point. The question actually told you, it said tangent to the curve at this point. Now, when it comes to that point, you don't sub the y value. Remember, it's always referring to the x value. So you're really finding the derivative at x equals a. So that's how you're going to find m. 
Okay, so now to find m, m equals to the derivative of the graph. Now, what's the derivative of 2e to the x, Naz? Fantastic. It is just itself, e to the x, right? Now, that's the derivative for, ev oh, for every point that tells you the gradients. But we don't want every point. We only want one point. And that particular point was at x equals to a. So therefore, my gradient must equal to 2e to the a. Have I confused anyone? Does that make sense so far? Good. All right, so what that tells me now is I know the equation. Instead of y equals mx, I now have y is equal to 2e to the a, which is my m, times x. All right, so I found m. That's one piece of the puzzle. What do I do now? I need to find a. How else can I do this? What are you going to do next? Zan, what will you do? Not too sure. We're trying to find a. So in order to find a, it means you have to remove every other variable. That's the only way to find a pronumeral, yeah? If you want to find x, you have to remove everything else. Now I've got an equation there. I've got y equals 2 times e to the a x. If I can somehow remove x and y. Daniel. Or do we use the point a minus 2 to the x? Perfect. See, this point is an x coordinate and a y coordinate. And that's part of the tangent line. So this is my tangent line. So that means when x equals a, y coordinate should be 2 times e to the a. If I stop that in, they're all in terms of a. That means you can re like remove the or manipulate the equation or find the inverse operations to find the value of a. See what I'm doing there? Okay, so it's just moving things around, but using what you have. You always have a coordinate, an x y coordinate, and you find m and you find c. So I haven't done anything different from what you did at the start of the chapter or exercise 10a. Finding c, finding m, using the coordinates. Yeah, same drill, just written differently. So here we go. We're gonna now say. All right, I'm going to do it in blue so we can see the difference here. We're going to say sub the coordinates of a to e to the a. So that gives me 2e to the a equals 2e to the a times a. Now from here, if this is in the exam, most students will make a mistake here. Not, not that it's a mistake. The answer will be correct. But the examiners don't like to see it this way. It's normally a, like a three mark question. There's a justification point. So. How do you solve A now? This next step is important. It's a common error that comes up. What would you do? Because there is an answer that most students will do. Actually, you can't really see it. I'll write it over here. 2e to the A equals 2e to the A times A. I want to solve for A. Just algebra, by plus by 2 times A. Perfect. So, here we go. So we can see that they're all times tables right now. This is 2 times, and that's times, and that's times. So you can say divide both sides by 2e to the a. This will cancel out to be 1. 2e to the a divided by 2e to the a is 1, and you get a equals 1. True? Now this is what all students do, or most students do. Yeah? And that's why I'm saying that's the technique I don't want you to do when it comes to the exams. Because, yes, you will get the answer, but you haven't justified, especially if there is uh, a part of the solutions they want you to justify. So if it's a three-mark question, what you're meant to do is not this. You still get an answer of A. I'll show you how you get the answer of A, but with a justification point. You see, I'll do an analogous one so you can see why it's important to do it this way. If I gave you this, if I gave you 2x equals to 2xA, why is this answer wrong if I said... If I divide both sides by 2x and I get 1 equals a, what's the problem? Why can't I just say divide both sides by 2x here? Yeah. It seems to make sense. What's my issue? It's one problem that I have omitted. Yeah. See, unless the question told you that x can't equal to 0, you're making an assumption here. See, if I divide both sides by 2x, I'm assuming that x can be any number except 0. Because if it's zero, then fine. But you can't just say, yeah, I'll divide it, and it counts out. Yeah, you can, but there's an assumption that you just made. And that's why, back in year, year 10 and 11, how you would have actually done this is you should have done this way. You should have said 2x minus 2xA equals zero. Factorize the null factor law. That's what you learned back in year 11 quadratics, yeah? So you'd say here, take out 2x as your common factor, 
you get one minus a equals zero and then you solve for it so null factor law here tells me that one minus a equals zero but you see here two times x x could also equal to zero so that's what i'm saying when you divide it you, you ignore that you ignore the possibility that x could equal to zero so when you divide it you're saying x can't equal to zero and that makes a difference in your domain whether it includes zero or it doesn't include zero so same thing here in the exam they will do something similar to this most students will do what we just saw divide both sides and you will get the answer correct but they're not going to give you that confidence they're going to be looking for that step in between so how do you do this question same thing you'll be moving everything across and you should be getting i'm going to do it in blue you got 2e to the a minus 2e to the a uh, times a equals zero and from this step you see you can then say take out 2e to the a is a common factor 1 minus a equals zero and yes it is true if 1 minus a equals to zero a has to equal to one so that's true you got your answer there but this is the nice part here 2e to the a equals zero you divide both sides by two you get e to the a equals zero and now if you want to find a e to the power of what will give you zero What was that, Jason? Oh, nothing. Yeah, we know the exponential curve has an asymptote at zero, at y equals zero, so e to the nothing will ever get a zero. That's why here you can now say a is undefined. But you see why this would make this particular question in exam an extra mark. The difference between what? The difference between what most students do here, where they take that step divided and they cancel all that out. That is a justification point. This is a better answer because it tells me or tells you what kind of student you are, how well you are in terms of the details and how you answer the question there. So this is justification saying this can't be true, therefore A must be 1. Okay, so you still get the answer, but you've got a justification point there. And that's what I'm saying. Every time you get a problem like that where it's equal, see if there's any factorization needed. Uh, or sometimes you don't need a factorization. Sometimes for this case, you know... There is no asymptote or there is no undefined value. Unlike this one, you knew that you can't divide by zero. But over here, it's fine. Okay, so you can divide both sides by 2e to the a. That's fine. I'm just saying be careful, be mindful of those kind of problems. Yes, Jack? Oh, they did it differently too. They equated the variance of 2e to the a and equated it to 2e a. They equate it with A. 3 A over A because they use the gradient formula. Oh, as in, yeah. Very cool. That works too. But wouldn't they end up still similar equals to A, 2 E A? How do you even solve that? 2 E A. Now the gradient would be Y2 minus y1, so 2ea over a yeah. is equal to 2ea. Yeah. So that would, oh, well, it ends up being the same thing. Yeah. yeah. It will end up being like this. True? Yeah. That's true, that's another way too. So what uh, Jack is saying is, we found the derivative, we've got this gradient, and that's a gradient of tangent line. There's another way to find the gradient of tangent line, x1, y1, x2, y2, y2 minus y1 of x2 minus x1 equate the gradients. That's another way to do it. Okay. All right, cool. But yeah, just keep in mind when you're solving up to that step, just keep in mind sometimes you have to be careful whether you're admitting a particular solution or not. Okay? How do we feel with that? Pretty good? Yeah? All right. Now, for today's session, we're going to do stationary points. Now, quick reminder, what's a stationary point again? Yes, Phoebe? Yeah, that's it. So in the exam, when they ask you to show if you have a stationary point or prove that there is a stationary point or find stationary points, the first mark that you get, you just got to say the derivative equals zero for or at stationary point. So for, you get a mark just simply saying that because that's what they want to know. They just want to know, do you know that stationary points have the derivative equals zero? Say that somewhere and yeah, that's, that's good. What you should be doing is something like this. I'll show you what I don't want you to do in the exams. So, for example, 
This question here. See that? In your exams, because a lot of students will get used to finding the derivative and then letting it equal to zero, they're really good at that. So what they do here is if the question says find stationary points, this is what they do. What do I do? What do I do here? The better question is, have I done anything wrong? Yeah. This, this technically they haven't done anything wrong. They'll figure out the answer, but the examiners won't look at that and go, fantastic. Okay? That is very poor in terms of what you are laying out. What I've just done here, a lot of us, if you can pick up what I did, then fantastic, great. But some of you will be like, what did you just do? See, this almost looks as if I just said y equals zero and then I found the derivative, right? That doesn't make sense. So what you're meant to do is take the steps before you get there. This is not this is how most students do it at the end of the exam, and that's not the way to go. What you're meant to do is you would say derivative of x equals zero at stationary points, or and up here you should have been saying dy dx. So the derivative equals to 2e 2x minus 2. And then you say derivative equals zero at stationary points. Therefore, you get 0 equals to 2e 2x minus 2. So that makes more sense. If I wrote it like that, now you will look at the solutions, even if you had no idea what to do, you look at that and you go, oh yeah, I get what he's doing. But if you went with the other step, it doesn't make any sense. Now, when it doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't make sense to examiners. They don't assume anything of you. They assume you're dumb. They assume you don't know anything. And that's how it works. If you don't lay out your answers, they're going to assume you don't know it. So you just got to look. Spell it out. Spell it out to them that you do know it. That's how I want you to lay it out. So when they ask you for showing, proving, finding stationary points, that's what I want to see. Derivative at this point for stationary points, that has to occur. So at least you get a mark if you got this one wrong. At least you knew derivative had to equal to zero. You get the derivative there. Okay. So just make sure to write that line before you do the derivative there. Okay, now well, let's just, uh, we now know what a stationary point is. It's when derivative equals zero. So derivative equals zero means the tangent line is horizontal. Okay, it's a horizontal tangent line. How do I solve this? How do I solve this now? So a lot of students now have to revise what they've done exponential in logs, and I know we haven't done that yet. So I'm going to show you two ways to do this question here. But zero equals two times e to the two x minus two. How do I solve this? What's the first step I'm going to do? Solve for x, that's true. Now how do I solve for x? What's the first thing I'm going to do? That's true. We do need the log of the 2 to remove the log. That's the later step. But before that step, and Sarah? Good. That's a minus 2. So inverse operations, add 2 on both sides. You get now 2 equals to 2 times e to 2x. That's 2 times e to the 2x. So removing times 2 divide 2 on both sides. So now you get 1 equals e to the 2x. Now this is where Kate just said we've got an exponential. What you are required to do at this point, because this is chapter 10, it's assuming that you know your exponentials already. At this point you're meant to use logs. Okay, so you're meant to say inverse of exponential base e is log base e both sides. So log base e of 1 and then you get 2x. Okay, so I'm, inver I'm doing log of base e. We'll, we'll revise this when we get to chapter 5 and 6. But at this point, log e, log base e of both sides, e's cancel out, that's why I've got 2x here. And we all should know log e of 1, which is? 0. zero. Okay, so you end up with a step where you say 0 equals 2 times x, therefore x is equal to 0. Now let's just assume that most of us have forgotten our logs and exponentials, then how else can I do this step when I get up to 1 equals e to the 2x? What did you do in year 9 to solve this problem? Usually in year 9 it was something like this, it would have been something like that. How would you solve this in back in year 9? And Sarah? You have to make the base the same. So how do you get 1 with a base 5? Yeah, so what you did in year 9 was what we called solving by comparison. So because you can only, so you didn't know logs back in year 9, so what you did was you said, well, 1 is the same thing as running 5 to the power of 0. This is 5 to the power of 2x. Now because they're equivalent, 5 equals to 5 to the power of 2x, that means the powers 
are also the same. So if the powers are the same, then you can say 0 must equal to 2x and therefore x equals to 0. Okay, so that's how you would have done it without logs, but it doesn't work for everything because what if it wasn't 0? Or what, what if it wasn't 1? What if it was 2? And how do you solve that? So that's why you need logarithms to figure it out. But back in year 9, the questions you had were all easy to do in terms of changing the powers. Uh, but that's a year 9 technique. Okay. How do we feel with that? 10C. Easy? Okay, so you're just finding stationary points. You know the derivative is equal to zero. Solve for A, B, and C. Yeah, those, those are the hardest questions for 10C. 10D now. Types of stationary points. How many types do we have? Say it again. Three. Which three do we have? What are the names again? What kind of stationary points can I have, Anne Sarah? Was there four or three? Good question. Good. Local maximum, local minimum. Stationary point of inflection. Okay, now there are three. Now there, you can say four because stationary point of inflection, there are two ways of getting stationary points of inflection. Okay, so let's revise that. That's for 10D. So moving to 10D, types of stationary points. Now what I've done there is your types of stationary points, local maximum, which you give the name for this point here, so that x equals 2, graded 0 for the tangent line. This is a local maximum. This is a local minimum at 4, so at x equals 4, it's 0 as well, graded 0. And then at x equals 6, that is a point of inflection. Now, you can have a point of inflection where if it's positive, 0, positive, or you can have negative gradient, 0, and then negative gradient again. Okay, so what it ends up looking like is like that. Okay, now anyone know what this is? What am I doing here? What's the plus plus, what's the plus minus, and negative 0? What, what's all that representing? Leah? Perfect. We call this a sine diagram. So if you're doing spesh, then you can use what they call the double derivative. If you haven't done spesh before, then you can use what we call the sign diagram. And that's the expectation for method students. If you're specialist students, yes, you can use uh, the double derivative. And you can say, you know, if it's greater than zero, then it's a uh, local maximum. Or is it minimum? I can't remember now. If it's negative to, if it's less than zero, it's a maximum. And if it's uh, greater than zero, it's a minimum. And if it's zero, it's a point of inflection. Yeah, but that's, that's for special. Okay, so. The only one thing I want to reiterate with this particular type of method, if you're doing the sign diagram, what I've just done here is wrong. This is not good, okay? The reason why it's not good is because in the exams, there's no point putting plus and a minus. You haven't proven anything. Most of the time they'll say justify the nature and me putting a plus and a minus sign doesn't, doesn't cut it. How do I know it's a positive? How did I know it's a negative? You have to prove that, okay? So I'll do an example just to get you to understand what I mean. So let's say, I don't even know what kind of equation this one is. Let's make it up. I'm going to make it up. Let's go to my drawing board. Let's do, let's make up one now. I don't know which one's going to work out nice. Maybe even numbers. x minus 2, x minus 4, x minus 6. Okay. Let's say that's my equation. Okay, I'm just going to expand it to figure this one out. So, clear history, expand, was it x minus 2, x minus 4, x minus 6. That gives me x cubed minus 12x squared plus 44x minus 48. Okay? Now, if we were to find the stationary points, you would say, find the derivative and then let it equal to zero, true? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to say, find the derivative, do y dx, derivative of x cubed minus 12x squared plus 44x minus 48, x, I mean 48, what is that, chi? Good. Now, because I made it up, I don't know how the factorization goes, whether this is going to work or not. I'm just going to quickly do it on a calculator, okay? So we know at dy dx, 
it has to equal to zero for stationary points. Stationary points. So here we go. I'm going to say dy dx equals zero. Zero equals three x squared minus twenty four x plus forty four. Now, if you didn't have a calculator and you want to solve for x here, what's another way of doing this? Two ways. There's two ways to do it. Yes? You could take out the 3. So if you take out the 3, you get x squared minus 8x plus... I'll just do 44 and 3. Okay, you can do it that way, but I still haven't solved for x. What would I do from here? There's two methods, so this is going along one of the methods. What would you do? Back to quadratics, chapter 4. Good. You either complete the square or quadratic formula. Okay, so those are the two. So if you were doing this by hand without a calculator, that's how you'd do it. And it looks to me like there's not going to be a nice solution. So we're going to have to do... Oh, I don't know why I made up this answer. Um, maybe we just do this. Solve 3 times x squared minus 24 times x plus 44 equals 0 comma x okay cool there we go so using my quadratic formula x is equal to negative 2 root 3 plus 6 over 3 and then that's then or x equals to positive 2 root 3 is it plus six? Yeah, plus six. What's wrong? Negative twelve. Positive twelve. Thank you. Positive twelve. There you go. Okay, so now you get these two points. Now, when you're doing your sign diagram, these are my stationary points, meaning is the bottom one as well. Sorry. Wait, is there two times? Yeah, you're right. Okay, so your stationary points now are at either whatever this value is. I'm just going to figure out the decimals for it so we can understand it a bit better. Anyone know how to do this in decimals? Good. Hold control. Press enter and you get the decimals for it. Okay, so now you get 2.84 and 5.15. Okay, so 2.84 and 5.15. Now, if you think about it, when you do your sine diagram, the top line represents your x values, the bottom line represents your dy dx, which is the gradients. So if I want to know is 2.84, see, I know the derivative was equal to zero before, that's what I figured out. What I want to know now. Is it a maximum, minimum, or point of inflection? You have to choose a number smaller than 2.84 and a number greater than 2.84 and then figure out the derivative, right? Now, the derivative equation we had was dy dx was equal to 3x squared minus 24 times x plus 44, yeah? What I'm saying is if you chose a number less than 2.84, let's say 2 and then 3, okay, it's not good to then say positive or negative. Okay, what you have to do is actually work out what is the gradient at 2 and what is the gradient at 3. So you would say something like at x equals 2, dy dx, and you sub 2 into the derivative. Okay, now I'm going to do that on a calculator just to save a bit of time. I'm just going to do this. Yeah, define f of x equals that. So f of 2, that gives me 8. So that now tells me my positive, that's a positive gradient. So it looks like that. Zero gradient looks like this. Now what I don't know is, is this going to be a maximum or it could be a point of inflection. Now logically, this is a cubic graph, so it has to have a maximum rather than a point of inflection. Okay, so I now know at x equals 2, dy dx equals 8. Then the next one is at x equals 3, I need to find out the derivative. So the derivative here, f of 3, you get negative 1. And so that tells me it's a local maximum. Okay? Now, that's why these questions in your exams or your SACs, if they ask you to justify or state the nature of the stationary points, you cannot just say local maximum, local minimum. 
you have to go through these steps. That's why they're three to four months, okay? Because they, they do have that expectation that you get to this step, obviously it won't be this nasty, with like a nice whole number. And then numbers that you choose, you can choose any numbers as long as it makes it easy. I could have done zero for all I get. I could have done zero and that would work. It's just that you just want to make sure that it doesn't intercept with the other stage of the And so I should have done zero and would have been 44, would have known it's positive. And then you could have just done three solve for that one. But what I'm trying to say is don't just put the plus and minus sign. That's not how you show, or that's not how you justify. This is how you justify. Okay, so I've only justified 2.84 for local maximum. I haven't justified 5.15. So if you want to do that, you have to do the same thing for 5.15. Choose a number less than between 2 and 5, and then a number greater than 5.15. Okay, so if I were to do this entirely, you would now say, all right, x, do y dx, and then you do 5.15. You know this was 0. And I can choose, let's say, 4 and 6. Okay? So at x equals to 4, do y dx is equal to, and then at x equals 6, do y dx is equal to. And then same thing, because I got the calculator, I'm just doing 4, and then f of 6, negative 4 and 8. So negative 4, 8, negative, 0, positive. So now you know at x equals 2, what was it again? It was negative 2 root 3 plus 12 on 3. It is a local maximum. See how I'm answering my questions? They're very sequential. It's logical in the way I, I lay it out. And that's how you should do it when you're answering your questions when justifying. And here, therefore, at x equals 2, 2 root 3 plus 12 over 3. Uh, it is a local minimum. Okay, that's the expectation I have when I'm marking your sex, or if I'm not going to mark the exams, but if I mark your sex, the questions do ask you to justify. That's what I'm looking for. So I want to see those steps. Alternatively, if you do special, you can do the double derivative. You just got to state what it means when you're doing the double derivative. Okay. Any questions on that? Good. That's 10D. Okay, so 10C, stationary points, just means derivative equals zero. 10D, types of stationary points, and likely you'll be doing questions like that, where you've got to prove its nature, and then you know, state whether it's maximum or minimum. Okay, so that's 10C, 10D. Cool. 10E, just by theory, what's uh, absolute maximum and absolute minimum mean again? Anyone remember? So back to the slide. Next two is absolute maximum, absolute minimum. What was that again? That's 10E. Yeah, literally. Oh, not the endpoints actually. No, not endpoints. What was it again? Endpoints of what? Like on that graph will be the. Yes, of this graph will be the endpoints. But what's the definition of absolute max, absolute minimum? What was it again? Absolute max, absolute minimum. And that's? Yes, that's it. It's your range. So your range, your absolute highest. The reason why I say that is because if you have a graph that looks like uh, like, like that. Okay, so the endpoints won't be the absolute max minimum. This is an absolute minimum, but the absolute max is also the local max. Yeah? So it really just means the highest range and the lowest range. Okay, so the highest y value, lowest y value. And that's what 10 e is about. 10 e is about you sketching the graph, uh, like the example I just did up there. That one would likely come up and they'll ask you, what is absolute max, absolute minimum? They're really just saying, what's your maximum range and your minimum range? That's what it means. Okay, so max range or max y value and minimum y value. Okay. We'll do some problems for next session. There's a double session, so I'll do some questions where you can see you have to sketch the graph, you have to find the stationary points, you have to find the x-axis intercept, sketch the graph, and then say, what's the absolute max minimum? That's why 10E is tedious, but it's, it puts everything together. So it puts in your polynomial functions, so chapter one, 
Okay, it talks about range, it talks about domain, it talks about derivatives, stationary points, chapter 10, and in this case, massive minimum. That's why 10 is nice, it ties everything together. Um, but like I said, chapter 1, chapter 9, those are your basics and those are your fundamentals. You're going to learn those. All right? Coolies, I'll leave you there so you can do 10E and 10D. And I'm going to pause the video as well.